had some major flaws, and Solomon certainly did. Uh, after his death, Israel, and in this case I'm saying all of Israel, was never the same. It's so important to know that after the monarchy, the three kings, Saul, David, and Solomon, after Solomon's death, Israel, as a people, would never be the same. And we will see that borne out uh, in the rest of our studies. First and Second Kings documents most of the shameful history of the Hebrew people uh, in the uh, tribes that were divided. And it really just highlights the God's mercy and grace. When you're reading all this stuff, don't get so bogged down in the details that you forget to see the, the greater picture. How God is full of mercy and love and, and grace, that he is still faithful to his covenant even when people are not faithful to him. It's amazing. He's faithful to us, and I'm, I'm be glad that he is. So we have some introductory slides. We have here, uh, again, the list that by the time the second quarter starts, one week after, by the way, since this Wednesday quarter series only had 12 Wednesdays. Have you noticed that? Only 12. So we won't need the books until one week after the next quarter begins. Uh, but picking up where we left off last week, First and Second Samuel, what was that all about? Well, here's the one-line content. Israel demands a king, turns out to be quite disappointed. David is a man after God's choosing, becomes king of Israel. But First and Second Kings, here's something to listen for. Israel knows peace under Solomon, but splits with two lines of bad kings. It was never the same after Solomon. Second Kings, what's that all about? It's the continuing saga. The, kingdom, the kingdoms uh, are both ignored. Let me reword this. Both kingdoms ignore God until they both fall captive to world empires. Whew. And true to the nature of people who don't care about God anymore, they don't care enough to care. That's just the nature of the beast. So as we look at now second, first and second kings, we bring to your attention, oh, this is a good pose shot. I like this being the thumbnail image, and so I'm going to pose like this. Okay, that's my pose shot. Okay, thank you. Now, we, <laughs> there's shaking her head. If you see on the screen now, and sometimes I'm looking down when the best slide is on there. I like, Michael, look up, look up. Oh, I didn't look up. I remember that. We have here the reading assignments. I know it's a lot to ask of you to read two or three hours of, of uh, text a, a week. And I understand that. If you keep a mental note that you might miss a book, that's okay. Go back and catch up later. But to the best of your ability, these classes are most beneficial if you either are, are, are listening with that knowledge already in your mind or... Listen to the teaching points of what to anticipate. Then you hear more of the text. But those are some of the key passages. We have here um, the Pentateuch again, showing the categories of Old Testament books. For a while, it was chronological, wasn't it? Genesis through Deuteronomy. And then the Hebrew history, conquering of Canaan, the period of the judges, and now the period of the kingdoms. Uh, according to the Hebrew, it's just the, the book of kingdoms. Interesting, isn't it? And it's within this time period that a lot of other books are written. The events thereof, anyway. So, for example, there were a lot of poetry literature written. Wisdom. Proverbs. Ecclesiastes. Obviously during Solomon's day. But also, because of the divided kingdoms and who was the king in the north or the south, a lot of prophets, like cards, are shuffled into this period as well. This is where it can get confusing, but this is where it can get interesting. As we study each prophet, we will refer back to the period of the kingdoms and say, who was the king? Was it north or south? And, oh, that makes sense. He was the good king. He was actually one of the few, or they were, oh, that was one of the bad kings. They were certainly in the majority. But simply put, both books help us appreciate Jesus as the king of kings. That's just something to keep in your mind. Here are some books written in that time period of tonight. In the divided kingdom, you have... What we've mentioned, plus Obadiah, Joel, Jonah, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, and Micah. They are each their own study, but it's good to know. Here's where we are. Here's what's happening. A very significant portion of history. And what's the essence of it? Well, the kingdoms divide, and the north kingdom falls to Samaria. We have the time to do this. Instead, I'm going to just let the Old Testament uh, cover the first two minutes. And then I'll advance it after that. Just the um, first three rows for an Old Testament overview. Here we go.
Welcome to Three Minute Bible Study on Biblical History. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God created man and woman. Creation was good. Then Adam and Eve rebelled and fell from God. Wickedness increased, and judgment came in the flood on all but Noah and those in the ark. Noah's descendants were dispersed at the Tower of Babel, and God chose Abram and his seed to receive the promised land, to become a nation, and to bless all nations. The promise continued to Abraham's son Isaac and his son Jacob, also known as Israel. Jacob had 12 sons, one of which would rise to the right hand of power in Egypt. The Israelites came down to live in Egypt, but later became enslaved for about 400 years. Through Moses, God delivered them and made a covenant with them at Sinai, where they received the law and instructions for the tabernacle. But being unfaithful, they were detained in the wilderness for 40 years, and the next generation took the promised land under Joshua. Judges then led the people until Samuel's day when Saul was appointed the first king of Israel. After Saul's rejection, God chose David to be king and promised that his seed would be a son to God, would build a house to God, and his kingdom would be established forever. David's immediate son Solomon did build the temple, but the promise of a kingdom forever would be part of the messianic hope in Israel. After Solomon's death, the nation divided into northern and southern kingdoms, both largely unfaithful and ignoring the prophets calling for repentance. As prophesied, both nations fell, Israel to Assyria in 722 B.C. and Judah to Babylon, along with the destruction of the temple in 586. After the Babylonian captivity, many returned to the land with Zerubbabel and Ezra and rebuilt the temple, followed by Nehemiah, who rebuilt the city walls. And there's your two-minute Old Testament preview. We have a lot of writing to do in the second half of this portion, so I want to share with you some information that's not in your outline. Sometimes I shuffle these through, but I've learned it's easier for me and maybe better for us to have an insight into the books before we look at the outline that we have. Then we, I think, learn more from it. This is from the Look of the Book series, and it's available in our church library in case you wonder, how can I get that? And if you're taking good notes, if you go back and screenshot some of this, that's fine. When it comes to the book of 1 Kings, it's really two themes according to that production. The history of Israel, as it started under Samuel. But then to show that the nation cannot stand without God. It's God's chosen people. And if they choose to not follow God, it's just not going to continue. Here's a key text. Very important text, 1 Kings 9. As for you, if you walk before me in integrity of heart and uprightness as David your father did, and do all I command you and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish, establish, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever. Reminds me of last week. One of my favorite captions of last week was when God says, essentially, you, David, can't build my house, but I will build yours. Oh, that's so good. Um, let's see. As I promised David your father when I said, you shall never fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. And metaphorically, it's fulfilled in Christ. If we don't know that, we're in a whole heap of trouble uh, with our understanding of the flow of Scripture. But if you or your sons turn away, here's here's the disclaimer, here's the caveat, the warning. If you or your sons turn away from me and do not observe the commands and decrees I've given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them... I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. Israel will then become a byword and an object of ridicule among all the people. Now, even though God's getting the ridicule in that sense vicariously, uh, it's not on him, it's on the people. So that's key to remember. Uh, We could have a whole class on this. The book has no reference to the Messiah, but ah, to the Christian student, the one who loves to study the New Testament and cares about Christ. There are several references in the New Testament that arc back to First and Second Kings. You'll understand more of the context of Acts chapter 7 if you know about Solomon's temple. Uh, when you read Matthew chapter 12, it'll make sense when you hear about the Queen of Sheba. And I'll make a reference later tonight. And just on and on and on. You can learn about Jezebel, I, uh, Elijah, and the drought. We didn't spend much time on that Sunday, on that part of it. But how God provided for him, Elijah's prayer, we didn't focus on that. And then, of course, am I the only one? And God says, no, there are 7,000 that I've reserved who have not bowed the knee. And that's encouraging when you read Romans chapter 11, and you feel just like uh, Paul is describing there. So it really helps you to understand this as a, as a New Testament Christian. There are a lot of major lessons, but essentially, God is sovereign, and we need to take his counsel seriously. Look at point six. Do not forsake wise counsel of the elderly, for the 
rash counsel of the young friends. One person took some bad advice. After he had heard the good advice, history would have been far different. But First and Second Kings will cause you to ask yourself, do I care about righteousness or want my way? Sunday's lesson is kind of about that, so I'm not getting too much into detail yet. Uh, but the question is, do I want God my way or do I want God to have his way with me? Background of the book. The word itself was, uh, was from the first word found there by noun for kings. And the first and second kings was really just kings. And we often refer to it sometimes as the collective book of kingdoms in the Hebrew uh, tradition. This book covers 120 years of time. And a lot happened during that time. It begins with the reign of Solomon in 971 B.C., before Christ, <laughs> and concludes with the reign of Ahaziah, I don't often pronounce it, I see it, but I don't often pronounce Ahaziah, of Israel in 852. A good summary. The period of history covered by the narrative of 1 Kings takes us from the political, social, and religious grandeur of the United Kingdom under Solomon to the disgrace and division of Israel and Judah. The book opens as David is dying, Solomon is anointed as king, and following Eastern custom, he puts to death all possible rivals. Wow. And Israel becomes so immoral. And that's what makes a person like Elijah, the hero that stands out against the background of that, and does a lot to put him on, uh, put them back on the right path. He comes out like quote unquote a human lightning flash. Uh, certainly had an impact on Israel and Judah, and still leaving us. Second Kings. One or two main themes. We need to totally depend upon God's word to guide us. God works providentially, to protect the royal line of David that would end ultimately in Jesus. When you see how all the tribes are divided, dispersed, and then diffused, except for the two south, and then of course primarily Judah, you'll just stand back and think, wow, God is sovereign. He can work His will no matter what people do. Key text of Second Kings. The Israelites persisted in all the sins of Jeroboam, and, which is not a good thing, and did not turn away from them until the Lord removed them from his presence. And as he had warned through all his servants, the prophets, at least he warned them. And frankly, a lot of people today aren't comfortable hearing the prophets today, unless you care about truth. First Kings, or no, Second Kings now 23, 27 says, So the Lord says, I will remove Judah also from my presence. Wow. As I removed Israel, and I will reject Jerusalem, the city I chose, and this temple, about which I said, there shall be my name, or there shall my name be. It meant something. But if we don't care about what it means, it doesn't mean what, it care, what we should care about. And that's the nature of how tragic this is. I think about Jeremiah when, the, uh, when it was destroyed and how he was lamenting more so. So the book of 2 Kings doesn't have a direct reference to Christ, but it does have a lot of uh, quotations that you can see and a lot of comparisons. That could be a great study. Screenshot it. Have fun with that. We also see the miracles of Elijah and Elisha. I used to have a hard time knowing which one came first. Until you study it, then you just get more familiar with it. Elijah was first, but then you see a double portion of, Elisha, uh, of, of Elijah's spirit in Elisha. So you see some key miracles by Elijah. Almost twice as many, by the way, of, of Elisha. But this was a time of intense miracle uh, focus to enhance the message and to validate the message of the prophets, and namely these two. So that's a great study as well to see how God worked through these two men to get across many points in their context. Uh, they should have listened for sure. A key lesson I wanted to focus on, number three, God requires obedience to his commands. And number eight, God in providence will protect his royal seed in order that his plan to redeem man may be completed. Wow. And in all of this, don't think that God does not have his time to judge sin. I just don't want to be the object of his wrath. 
So, in summary, the book of 2 Kings opens during the reign of Ahaziah over Israel and continues, of course, through the destruction of the kingdom of Judah. This is major because, hey, doesn't God have a covenant? There is no other tribe left. Judah and Benjamin are in Jerusalem. What's going to happen? <laughs> the failure to remove the idolatrous nations from the land had caused a continual uh, deterioration of faithfulness. Judah had 19 kings. Most of them were worshipers of both idols and God. Israel lasted for a period of about 250 years. When we say Israel, that's the northern kingdom with 10 tribes in it. Coming to an end with the destruction of the capital of Samaria by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. But what about Judah? The tribe of Judah and Benjamin down south lasted for another 150 years. But you would have think that they would have learned their lesson, but no. The new world power, Babylon, was allowed by God to judge them for their sin of uh, just leaving God's way. In 586 B.C., technically then 606, and then three deportations, and you got 586 B.C. Um, in the middle, where that little blue dot is, the book demonstrates clearly the loving kindness of God to those who are faithful. It also powerfully displays the righteous judgment of God upon all who depreciate the covenant relationship with him. His own people are not excluded from judgment. That's a lesson to us. That's a lesson to us. So, let's get to our outline now, and it's pretty straightforward when it comes to what you have. I even made sure, now check this out, uh, you have a lot of would-be blanks to fill in when I noticed how many blanks there were, so a lot of this you won't have to write down. But let's begin with the introduction, as you see on the screen and in your provided handouts. These two books, learn about, well, we learn about Israel and Judah. All about the kings, except for the first two. We also are introduced to the period of the great prophets. This is where the prophets come into play. Also, there will be much parallel in First and Second Chronicles. The differences will soon be noted. Okay, the name of the book, again, just like First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings were originally one, one big scroll, and it's referred to as the Book of Kingdoms. But we refer to it as what we know it today, First and Second Kingdoms. Or first and second kings. <laughs> the author is perceived to be Jeremiah. There's a lot of contemporary, um, uh, there's a lot of similarities with his style, but there's a lot of doubts as well. He was taken captive and, and hidden in Judah, I mean Egypt, hidden in Egypt. And so you wonder who wrote the, the latter part of that. And we think about how history is written down, but then later compiled. Uh, the, the events in which it's referring to were had already happened by the time that the book was compiled and finished, and that's something to think about. So it's very well uh, preserved and inspired about a time period after uh, the events, of course, certainly took place. And that's good to know. And it's interesting to think about it in this way during the days of the Babylonian captivity. How interesting would that be? Uh, but they certainly would care about that because they wouldn't be able to go to Jerusalem and do much else. The purpose the purpose of the book is to notice the welfare of the nation ultimately depended on the people's faithfulness to God. And uh, it is an indispensable support. How can you expect to maintain God's nation, yourself as God's nation, if you're not faithful to God? And as a church, we need to have that mindset. As a, as a Christian, we need to have that mindset. We've got to stay faithful to God. And then point two, C2, to show that each king responded to God, either fulfilling or rejecting God's covenant. You know, the good kings of the southern kingdom of Judah in Jerusalem totaled 8 of 20. Out of 20 kings, 8 were good. The good kings out of Israel, the northern kingdom in Samaria, was zero. Absolutely zero. It's amazing. So the background of the book, four periods of time. Very simply put, David's death, <laughs> Solomon's reign the division of the kingdom, and the fate of both. At this point in history, notice uh, 2A1. 2A1. The northern kingdom of Israel was known as Israel. This is so important when terms are now used. If you're in this period of history, and you say Israel, you're referring to the ten tribes up north. Now, before the division of the kingdom, you say Israel, you're talking about the united monarchy under, under Saul, David, Solomon. 
or the people of Israel under Moses, you know, the Hebrew people. But I've heard some people say, you know, and, and it's a common uh, term to say, oh, those Jews back in Moses' day. Uh, not quite, not quite. It, not quite, you know, but, but we're close, you know. Yeah, but at this point in history, after the division of the kingdom, and you say Israel, the northern kingdom, and its leading tribe, my, by majority as well, is Ephraim. So Israel did not have a single righteous king. But what about the southern kingdom? It was known as Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah, two tribes, Judah, Benjamin. Judah had only one dynasty, however, in contrast to the northern kingdom. They, they just kind of, it's almost like you can say, forget them, you know their fate, they're not going to follow God, and God forgot them too, that kind of thing, right? Um, but the southern kingdom of Judah had only one dynasty, and it's important because of the prophecy that was fulfilled. And number three, the account ends with total collapse and mass deportation to Babylon. This is where we have the accounts of people like Daniel and others. How fascinating, isn't it? And, of course, I think about Jeremiah and how he laments greatly this tragedy because he still cares for God when it seems like no one else didn't or did. Letter D, the kings of Judah and Israel. When you're reading this, you'll have to stop and maybe look at this outline on page 2 and think, okay, where are we at here? <laughs> the dates can help you, but it just helps you see when you hear a name to go back to the list and say, oh, okay, we jumped from the north to the south now. And, oh, okay, we're going back from the south to the north. And this time, this prophet was sent to both of them. And it just kind of helps you keep track of that. So enjoy that list. The one on the screen with these dots, the capital letters, show which ones were actually semi-good. But my favorite, as we might think of, is... Well, Josiah down there, great story and account with how that young man with good training and counsel brought people back to a revival of the Lord when he found the book of the law. Can you imagine today if people in church buildings found this book all over the country? Wow, and all over the world. And of course, in the days of King Uzziah, Ahazariah, uh, Azariah, uh, that's a great account too. But then it was... Uh, an interesting occasion there to, to see the glory of God and how he still rules over his people. Uh, each one of these, I know of a preacher who had a series on each of these, and I've never done that, a series of each of the kings. That might be a good idea sometime. So we want to remember that. The main messages of the book. What's this all about? After everything we've now said, the main message of this book, both of them, that is, attempt to show the fate of Israel and how it depended on their observance to show uh, observance of the Lord's covenant with them. Whether they succeeded or failed depended on their obedience or observance, whichever one you prefer to say. Notice this, though. Letter B. The reign of each king is assessed not in accordance to his political or historical significance, but according to the spiritual life of that king. And isn't it interesting and not surprising that the Bible emphasizes whether or not they were righteous or not. So you have an example here. If you look at the dates up there for Uzziah and just do the subtraction, 792 to 4, 70, uh, 740, he reigned for 50 years, and yet we only have seven verses about him. And what are those seven verses saying about him? Whether essentially he was good or bad. Isn't that interesting that they, we see it that way? And that's a lesson to us. Sometimes we need to see that the way the scriptures causes us to evaluate the value of our life. We need to see it in measuring terms of how our relationship with God is. It's about our relationship with God. That's always what's most important. And that affects everything else. I'll say it this way. If Jeroboam had been spiritually minded, the nation would have not divided under him. And who knows what history would have been. But we know what it was. The outline of the book... Y'all can read a little bit about David's oldest son and how he tried to, you know, grab the throne after David's death uh, and during that time. But, nope, Solomon was going to be the one. And Solomon reigned because his authority and wisdom, wisdom came from God. And it started very well. <laughs> He's, because he asked for wisdom, God blessed him with so much. And the Queen of Sheba, uh, in history, you may have heard the phrase, the half has not yet been told or heard, the half had not been heard. Well, she came to visit this experience, and she had no idea. She said, I, I, it's, uh, the, the glory in which Solomon was arrayed and how things worked just blew her away. 
And that's interesting to think about. He made alliances with the world. We have time to mention this, I think. If not, I'm hoping that we do. <laughs> uh, we probably don't. But um, 1 Kings 3, 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to read this. First Kings 3, starting with verse 1. Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. So the people sacrificing at high places, however, because he had no house yet, built a house in the name of the Lord. So in that one portion of scripture, you see some good and you see some not so good. Uh, let's go ahead and turn to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. And we see here that he's welcoming influence of different faith. This, in some ways, is strategically wise for your so-called peaceable time. But how do you define peace? Uh, not always by quiet. Uh, and uh, the influences were welcomed. And as a result of intermarrying and welcoming other uh, religions that way, you are prostituting your own faith. Uh, and we see that. 1 Kings chapter 11. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, and arcing back to the whole group, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And you can continue reading. That's exactly what they did. 700 wives, princesses, 300 concubines. Verse 6, So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. And then you read about how structures are built in respectful honor of the gods that Israel should have no part of. Oh boy. Solomon, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? Well, with that being said, let it be the first 80 years of the divided kingdoms is what we see. The first 80 years of the divided kingdoms from this point forward. Uh, Solomon's death divided the nation. And Solomon's son, Rehoboam, foolishly precipitated. Uh, yeah, when I said Rehoboam earlier, sorry about that foolishly precipitated a revolt against his subjects after he took his father's place. And to think about this, pridefully rejecting good advice to have unity and respect from the people that you are to lead. It, it amazes me how people who are in elevated, uh, elected, or high of places of, of authority have no respect for the people who they are to, to uh, tend to and take care of and guide. It's amazing to me, but you know what? Pride is, in, in, is the trouble of humanity, and it leads to all of this. So he did not lighten Israel's burden, and as a result, you see the nation divided. Jeroboam became the king of the northern kingdom, and Rehoboam became the king of the southern kingdom. And this worked out really good. We got some blanks to fill in and just enough time to do it. The northern kingdom was known as Israel, and it had ten tribes. It had three times more land and twice as many people. That doesn't really matter. But also to say, its capital city was Samaria. Take note, New Testament scripture student, because this begins the understanding of who these people are and how they were later referred to as mutts or half-dogs uh, or half-breeds, dogs because of how they were diffused and welcomed. And even after Babylonian captivity, it, it still is strong there. But that's, that's, it's coming together. The southern kingdom was known as Judah and had two tribes, just two. And, of course, Judah was the key. Its capital was, thankfully, Jerusalem. That was an advantage because it also had Solomon's temple. That was very important. We have here King Jeroboam and how he led Israel, the northern kingdom, to worship of golden calves. Wow. 
He had this idea that if we don't give them something to worship, they'll go down and worship God like they should. Go figure. We can't have that. So he gave them golden calves. What's the deal in the scriptures about golden calves, right? Wow. Just wow. Egypt invaded, though, and defeated King Rehoboam of Judah. That's of interest. Uh, details momentarily sparing. We'll come back to that, Lord willing. Number four, God therefore sent Elijah to show that willful sin brings dreadful results. Willful sin. Okay. His encounter on Mount Carmel was very significant. We had a lesson on that Sunday. One of the more memorable events. Elijah died, however, and passed on the mantle to, and there it is, Elisha. Oh, Elisha. Great account of inspiration to inspire you to do your best for God. And then number three, C3. Israel was exiled to Assyria. Assyria. And the northern kingdom simply, and you can use the word refused to repent, that's fine, or you can write the words ceased to exist. Either one that works for both. Refused to repent, and therefore they ceased to exist. If you ever hear about the ten lost tribes, this is what it's talking about. Uh, it's just gone. It's just gone. Letter D, the remaining years of the southern kingdom. When Israel fell to Assyria, Judah was being ruled by a good king, Hezekiah. Hezekiah, good king. Thank you, thank you. Under him, God delivered Judah from the Assyrian invaders under Sennacherib. So that's where we are in history. Study about Sennacherib, how he bragged about himself, but didn't talk much about that experience, did he? <laughs> Great account of God's deliverance. And then, of course, Isaiah. Isaiah was a contemporary of Hezekiah. So that's interesting to think about um, how they would have helped or known about each other and then their interactions. So, number four, Judah's last righteous king was Josiah, an eight-year-old king who discovered the book of the law and had a great revival on the land. However, though, in 606 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, became or began to dominate Judah. And that's where you have deportations of slaves from Jerusalem to Babylon. And we have good old Daniel, a great, great person to study and spend months of your life appreciating in great detail. He is such an inspiration of how he stayed faithful. And then, of course, you have the, uh, his friends and the account that was most familiar uh, of the furnace and the fire and all of that good. But Judah would be captives for 70 years in Babylon. They would focus on the law, and that's a good thing. Let us see. The very next year, Zedekiah's reign ended, though, and Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was ransacked, and Israel would never be the same. So this is sad. This is, like, tragic. This is, this is terrible. Jeremiah, the only hope he's got is the promise of the Messiah to come. Somehow he knew King Cyrus of the Persians would come back, right? And, and would come onto the scene and allow them to return, and God would bless them again and bring about the Messiah. He, he, it's amazing what they knew and also what they didn't, but now we do. Key themes of the book. Can we do this? Oh boy, oh boy, we've got a lot of clicks here. Let's just put them on the screen. God dwells among his people. This was symbolic about his presence in the temple, but now we are the temple of God, and God is with us if we are with him. God's word confronts our sin, and the prophets certainly did. How do we respond? That's the key. The prophets had this message, and the word of God still does today. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. A lot of times people, I tell you, they're, they're not comfortable reading the prophets. If they're conditioned by society today, they might read the prophets or the Old Testament or any portion of the Bible and say, that sounds kind of intense. That sounds kind of insincere, or not insincere, but uh, uh, what's the phrase I'm thinking of? Very uh, stern. I'll just say stern for lack of a better word in the moment. And uh, forgiveness comes when there is repentance. So repent. Neglecting God's word leads to downfall. Always. Why would you want it? Fall in love with righteousness. God is patient, but his judgment will be handed down. Let us see. The Lord demands total loyalty. And why would he not? 
He's the all-righteous God who has given us His will and worked through all these ages to bring about the Messiah, even through these people who rejected Him. He still preserved that dynasty through David to fulfill His promise. You have an example of someone who's bad, like Jezebel. You have an example of someone whose influence was great, like Josiah. First and Second Kings has a lot of action. A lot of great accounts. And I think that you will enjoy listening to them while looking at these charts to keep track of it all. Don't get confused. Here's the template to put all this information in. But overall, just think of how Jesus is the King of Kings and He rules over those who allow Him to rule over their heart. And it's been great. So, next week, catching my breath, First and Second Chronicles, here are the key uh, chapters to read and I think you'll enjoy that as well. It's just the continuing saga of how God worked through the ages to bring about the Messiah. Hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you all so much for your time. Enjoy the fellowship.